a bride adorned for her husband. As a pastor, I have had the opportunity and some would say the privilege of standing up in front of a church like this to marry, this in the ceremony, marry couples. The marriage ceremony. And it is a, it's a wonderful time. It's an exciting time. I, I, over the years, have to learn to adjust my kind of my thinking that way. Somewhere along the line, I learned that when the invitation says that the wedding's starting at 2 o'clock, that doesn't mean anything whatsoever. <laughs> um, and I came to the point where I'd ask brides, okay, the invitation says 2, but what time is the wedding really starting? <laughs> And I, when I learned that little trick, I mean, my attitude about things became a whole lot better. Um, but on the day of the wedding, as a pastor, you stand in front with the groom, and the bride comes in, and everybody stands up, and they look. And I believe it's a God-ordained thing that on that day, the bride should be the prettiest woman in the room. And people are so joyful and happy. Standing next to the groom, I've learned to watch them. To watch their eyes, their facial expressions, to sometimes even audibly hear their whoa. Wow. As they look upon the bride, adorned, dressed up, ready. And that is the way that Jesus Christ looks at each and every one of you. One of the biggest and baddest lies of the great controversy between good and evil is that the devil has put within the hearts of people is that somehow God is angry at you. And that God is waiting for just the right moment, the right instance in time, so that he can pummel you and bring pain to your life to demonstrate to you what a bad and wicked person you are. But that is, a, that is the lie of the devil because what God sees is a bride adorned for her husband. God looks at you anticipating the idea and the experience of spending eternity with you. That is the God that we serve. He wants to spend eternity with us. Now the second symbol that's used here is the New Jerusalem. This is a, a, an interesting one. If we were reading earlier in the book of Revelation, we would have been given a physical description of the New Jerusalem. We're told that its length, its width, and its height are all the same. And when the length, width, and height are all the same, and we're going to assume that those um, distances are at right angles to one another, the geometric shape you have is a cube. Now, that confuses me a bit. Because God is our creator. He is a, just an imaginative, spectacular creator. Think of the animals that are out there. Never mind human beings, how different we are. But think of just in the animal world, how, how God is able to just um, make wonderful things, animals. I, I think a giraffe is absolutely a hilarious animal to look at. And God did that. I like um, the duck-billed platypus, half beaver, half duck, kind of looking. God has a sense of humor, and, but he's also able to create such beautiful things. Now when we talk about the kingdom of God, the city in which his people will be part of for eternity, all the creative genius that God has, and when he comes to their, our home for eternity, what does he come up with? A cube. It makes no sense to me. Why a cube? Why not something more spectacular? There's something going on here with this new Jerusalem. I'll, I promise to come back to that. The 
third symbol that is used concerning this eternal relationship that God wants to have with us is he says that the tabernacle of God is among men. Now, for the purposes of today's talk, I will, I will interchange the word tabernacle, I will um, sanctuary, tent, I'll use them all. I mean, if we were doing some sorts of studies, there's nuances that need to be spoken of, but for today, they're just going to mean the same thing. Now, let's, let's talk about the tabernacle. It says that God will dwell with his people. What did we read in, for our scripture reading today? Exodus 25, verse 8 said, and God speaking to Moses, Let them build for me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Do you hear what's going on there? The theology of heaven is in the sanctuary. Because God wanted the sanctuary built so that he could dwell among his people. That's what he wants to do, what we read in Revelation. He wants to dwell with us in eternity. And so when we look at the sanctuary, what we're looking at is God's way to try to establish this eternal relationship with us. And if we were looking at the other parts of the books of Moses today, we would see how the, um, the book, um, the tabernacle of God was set out and how he laid out the 12 tribes of Israel. And you can read where he's put three tribes to the east, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south. And if you've got a... Um, a bird's eye view over that, or you had a drone looking down, what you would see actually is God dwelling in the midst of his people, literally. God wanted to be in the middle of his people. This is not a God that wants to run away from his people, wants to straight arm them up away from him. He encourages them to be part in a relationship with him. And so now, let's, let's take this a little literal. You're literally. Uh, you, let's just say for today's argument, we're all members of the tribe of Benjamin. And we want to say, okay, God wants to have a relationship with me. So we get out of our tent and we walk down to the, to the center of everything. We go into the, the tabernacle where there were basically three sections. There was a courtyard. There was a holy place and a most holy place, and you know God is dwelling in the most holy place. So you walk down there, and you walk into the courtyard, and you say, I'm headed in to go see God. And before you could get very far, some Levites would stand up and put their hand out and say, whoa, 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 where, where are you going? Well, God wants to have a relationship with me. I'm going in to visit God. And they say, no, 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 no. You can't do that. What do you mean? God wants to have a relationship with me. The reason that you can't walk in is because of sin. But God has a way to deal with that. And so the, the priest would teach them how this worked. And so what he would do is he would instruct you to bring a lamb without blemish, a year old, bring it back to the, to the temple, and there you would place your hand on that innocent animal, and you would confess your sins. And at that moment, a miracle of grace took place that God allowed for the transfers of our ugliness, our sinfulness, our guiltiness to be transferred over to the innocence of the Lamb. And in turn, the Lamb's innocence is brought back to you. And in the eyes of God, you are innocent. But God has said that the soul that sins must die. And so that lamb had to be um, sacrificed. I have heard over time and read different things through the years that people say, well, the sacrifice of animals, that wasn't such a big deal for them. You know, they, you, you don't really feel anything, especially growing up in an agrarian farming type community. No big deal. Animals die all the time. That has maybe some merit, but we have to consider that this was sheep. Sheep were considered very different animals than just any wild animal. In fact, sheep were 
We're kept like pets. How do I know this? Jesus said in John 10, talking about himself being the good shepherd, he says, I call my sheep by name, and they hear my voice. Jesus is not making up something. When he says that he calls them by name, all the people understood exactly what he was talking about because they named their sheep. And if you give a name to an animal, that's very different than a wild animal. If you give a name to an animal, you have welcomed that, that animal into your family. You treat it differently. You treat it with care. You treat it with concern. You are emotional about that animal. And so it was one of these little lambs that had to be sacrificed. And when that was done... When that was done, then the, the, the animal needed to be dealt with. A small portion of the animal was burnt on the altar of sacrifice there in the courtyard. The largest part of the uh, animal was taken outside the camp and burned and destroyed outside the camp. There's a consistency there through scripture, the lamb representing Jesus, when Jesus died, where did he die? Did he die in the camp or outside the camp? Outside. When, at the end of time, the wicked approach the city of God, are they destroyed while they're inside the city or outside the city? Outside. Sin is always destroyed outside the city. And so the larger portion of the sacrifice was taken and destroyed outside the city. Small portion burned on the altar. But all that was left now was blood. And that's why the priest had these little basins, these little bowls. They would take some of the blood. And they would take that blood and they would walk it into the holy place of the sanctuary. Inside that holy place were three pieces of furniture. There was a table of showbread. There was a seven-branched menorah candlestick, and there was also another altar, an altar of incense. And they would walk in there, and between the veil, between the holy and the most holy place, they would take some of that blood, and they would throw that blood up against that veil, and another miracle of grace happened. Because what that blood represented was your sinful yet forgiven life has done through the Lamb of God. And what has happened now is that you are represented in the house of God. You have made it into the presence of God. What does that mean? What's the big deal? Okay, God has sacrificed for me. He has given me grace. He's given me forgiveness. That is all wonderful and great, but God does not leave us there. The three pieces of furniture help to teach us what God goes on to do. First, that table of showbread. It had 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. That bread stayed on that table 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. One time a week, it was swapped out. What is the bread? What does it represent? Well, let's for a moment take a bigger picture. The lamb represents Jesus. If we were to go into the most holy place with the high priest, Jesus, we have such a high priest, we're told in the book of Hebrews. So when we start looking for meanings in the holy place, I think the first place to look is Jesus. Jesus himself self says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. What, what does he mean by that? Well, Earlier on, in, in the, as Jesus teaches and preaches, in the way he teaches us how to pray in Matthew 6, give us this day our daily bread. Hearkening back to the time when Israel came up out of Egypt, and God, what did he do? He provided daily bread for them. He provided food for them each and every day. Twice on 
two portions on a Friday so that you didn't have to starve on a Sabbath. But God provided daily bread. What we see in the bread is, consistently through the scriptures, is that bread often represents God's ability to take care of the physical needs of his people. So when we, when we by faith accept the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, God does not just leave us there, he makes a promise with us, he makes a covenant with us. He says, I will care for your physical needs 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Does God always give us everything we want? No. He often doesn't give it in the timing that we want it. But when we look back, we always see that God cares for the needs of his people. And he makes that promise to us 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. He will care for those people who have put faith in the blood of the Lamb. Now if we walk across the, the little um, holy place and we have the seven branch candlestick, we have a very similar thing. The, uh, the lights on that candlestick burned 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Jesus says, looking for meaning, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. What are the meanings of these things? One of the greatest miracles that ever happened that's not recorded in the Bible, but is recognized by the Bible, is a miracle that happened around these, this candlestick. You can read some time about the Maccabees. There's a book called First and Second Maccabees. You can read about it, how the, the uh, Romans were trying to destroy Israel trying to destroy the temple. They wanted to take the temple over. They wanted um, uh, to slaughter um, foul, unclean animals in God's sanctuary. And what rose up was the um, Judas Maccabees, one of the great heroes of the Jewish faith. The priests during this time could not get in to put oil into the lamps for eight consecutive days. But the lights stayed lit for the entire eight days. That is called Hanukkah. That's where the story of Hanukkah comes from. That God allowed the lights to stay lit even though his priests were not able to put the oil in. Jesus himself, we can read this in the book of John, it's known as the Feast of Dedication, and we find Jesus in Jerusalem keeping the Feast of Dedication. He was recognizing this great miracle of the lights staying on, because it was so important for God to put forth the message that his light would not go out. It will stay lit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now what does light mean? I think one of the best places to go is Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my way. This is the light of God. This is the light of God. Thing is, I can't be reading this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But when I need remembrance of something that is in here, God is making a promise to me to bring to mind, to bring to memory the things that he wrote in his word. His spiritual guidance is there all the time. The light, the word, the oil, the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit and the word work together, we burn, we, they burn bright. And God is saying, I, when you put your faith in the blood of the Lamb, I am going to make a covenant to protect you spiritually 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The things that you learned in me and put into your heart, into your mind, I will bring to remembrance. So he will take care of us physically, he will take care of us spiritually, 24-7. We have a great God. Amen. Now there's that third piece of furniture in there, the altar of incense. Um, 
some will read that text in Revelation and say, well, incense represents the prayers of the saints. That's, a, that's an all right um, interpretation, but I think it's deeper than that. And this is why I, I say that. I mean, the lamb is Jesus, the light is Jesus, the bread is Jesus, the high priest is Jesus. Now we come to the incense and we say, that's our prayers? There's an inconsistency there. I think if we got to find that if the lamb is Jesus, if the bread is Jesus, the high priest is Jesus, if the light is Jesus, I think we need to find Jesus in the incense. And I think we can. Let me talk about the sanctuary from a very practical point of view. Artists who have drawn and made figures of the um, tabernacle have done so through the years and they're very helpful to us to understand what the pieces looked like, how it was arranged. Very helpful. But the thing about artists when they draw the sanctuary, they always draw it or paint it shiny, brand new, bright, clean. But the thing about it was, is that once that priest brought my blood into the sanctuary and started throwing it up against the veil, it's already becoming pretty dirty. Because guess what? I wasn't the only one to sin. The priest, there was a line of people coming in, a line of priests going into that sanctuary with bowls from, from sacrifices. <coughs> throwing that blood into the sanctuary. Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, blood was being brought into the sanctuary and tossed in there. Think of it for a moment. This was a sanctuary that had no ventilation, except for when the curtain opened up. It was out in a hot desert. Things were probably pretty foul in there. Teaching a lesson, wow, this place needs to be cleaned up. But we'll get to that in a moment. So here's this sanctuary, day after day, blood being brought in there, blood, blood, blood. First job I ever had where I received an official paycheck was working as a stock boy, bag packer, in an, an IGA supermarket. And I was in the Seventh-day Adventist at the time, but I was a workaholic then as much as I am now. And I was always trying to get as many hours as I could possibly get. And one of the things I could do is I could work um, Saturday afternoons, and this was even during school time. I could work Saturday afternoons, and the job was cleaning the meat room. And you have to go into the meat room, and all the tables have to be pulled apart. And uh, the different equipment. Everything had to be broken down and there were big brushes and uh, hose with hot water and mops and, and sponges and lots of chlorine bleach to try to make this place as clean and spick and bright as possible. But even when all that work was done, even among the bleach, in my nostrils, I could see I could still smell the dry blood. Those of you who work in healthcare know exactly what I mean. The sanctuary over time was just filled up with the filth and the representations of the forgiveness of much sin. And it was accumulating in there and being stored up and it was begging the question, when is this place going to get clean? But meanwhile, the priests needed to do their work. This is from a practical point of view. I think this is exactly why the incense was in there. So that they could walk in, get their work done, and didn't go out vomiting and gagging with the, the smell that was going on. That's it from a practical point of view, but let's think of it from a spiritual point of view. And I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 5. <coughs> Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul wrote this, verse 1.
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. The fragrant aroma that covers our sins is Jesus Christ. Amen. From another point of view, this is just one of the greatest things that Jesus can do for us. Because though I have been forgiven of sin, I still have a horrible human nature. I may be forgiven, but boy, it's a stinky forgiveness because it's not what God ultimately wants. God wants to transform and take our, our whole lives and make them new. He promises to do that. We can develop character before then. We should develop character before then. But the actual changing of our nature, sinful nature, does not happen until Jesus in an instant changes us. But until that time, he covers the stench of our sinful life. He is the aroma that covers our sinfulness. Praise to God. He takes care of us physically. He takes care of us spiritually. He promises to take care of us um, um, the, for the transformation of ourselves into new, new nature. He does this and makes this promise to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I love Jesus Christ. Now, there's still an issue. The place is dirty. It needs to be cleaned. And God set up one day in the calendar year when that would happen, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. <coughs> he would do this. There's a lot of technicalities. Don't fail me now, boys. There are a lot of nuances and, and, and parts of the Day of Atonement that I just can't take the time to go into today, but I want to go over the big picture. In the big picture, there were two goats chosen on that day. One, the lots were cast for them. One was chosen for God. One was chosen for Azazel. It's just another name for the devil. The goat that was selected for God is sacrificed and the high priest the one time of the year he goes from the courtyard into the holy place and into the most holy place this one time of the year. He comes with the offering of a goat. Again, another representative representation of Jesus. As he goes into the most holy place, into the presence of God, God gives the acceptance of the, the sacrifice on behalf of the people. And now the high priest does a 180 and he walks out. And he walks out, oh, again, back his, his steps through the holy place into the courtyard. And now he places his hand on the goat for Azazel. And he transfers all the sins, all the accumulated garbage of the past year, of the spiritual garbage of God's people. He translates, he transfers that to the goat. And that goat is taken out into the wilderness, and it is destroyed. The thing about this goat is that there was no forgiveness offered by this, the death of this goat. This is simply the retribution and the rightfully placing responsibility for sin upon the head of the devil. There is no redemption that happens through this sacrifice. Never mentioned anywhere. It is just the destruction of the devil, and as I pointed out earlier, outside the camp. Sin dies outside the camp. Now, what happens to the sanctuary? How did it get clean? Admittedly, I'm going to speculate here for a moment. But speculate, I think, with some good reasoning. When the high priest walked out of the sanctuary, representative, representatively pulling all the sin out of there, 
I do not think that as he walked out the front door, I don't think hiding underneath the back door and pulling up the tarps and uh, the, the skins and crawling underneath was a group of Levitical priests with brooms, mops, sponges, and ready to make the place spick and span. I don't think that's what happened. I believe, though we're not given any instruction on this, I do believe that once that high priest walked out, a miracle happened, and God in an instant changed all that was old into what was brand new, and made it bright and beautiful again. And why do I speculate that way? Because remember, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This sanctuary is in microcosm what God is trying to display for us for eternity with the earth made new. That God wants to dwell with us forever for eternity. If God can in an instant turn this world, this old world from junk into something bright and beautiful again, if in his creation he can do that in an instant, which I believe scripture supports, then making beautiful a tiny little tent is no problem for Jesus Christ. Representing brand new, representing the restoration of a relationship that had gone bad, but God, through the work of Jesus, has made all things new. Now, I made a promise to you to talk about the cube. Moses was not the only person that God gave instructions to about building a sanctuary. God also spoke to Solomon. Remember, David wanted to build a sanctuary. God said, no, you're a man of war. That can't happen, so your son will build it. So Solomon is building the temple. And God gives him some instructions about the temple. And if you're reading, I believe it's 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6, God gives a description of the sanctuary and he talks about the innermost sanctuary, in other words, the holy of holy place. And it says there that the, inner, the innermost sanctuary should be constructed this way. It should be 20 cubits long, 20 cubits high, and 20 cubits wide. The only other cube that we find in the Bible pointed out in New Jerusalem, the only other one is the most holy place. See, when we come to Revelation, and we find this big cube, what that is symbolic of is of a most holy place experience. What God is promising to his people is, is that if you have faith in the blood of the Lamb, you will dwell in my most holy place for eternity. Just as the high priest can do it, now you can do it through the blood of the Lamb. And the joy of this is, is that it's not a tiny most holy place. It's not a tiny cube such as the one that was there on the earthly tabernacle. This one's huge. It's not 20 cubits. It's 1,500 cubits wide tall and long. There's room in there for everyone. The New Jerusalem is symbolic of the, the most holy place experience God wants to have with us throughout eternity with nothing between us and Him. He wants us in the most holy place with Him just as Moses was able to look at Him face to face. As Adam was able to look at God and Eve face to face. This is the relationship that God is promising to all of us if we put our faith in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The time together of all this stuff is really, I think, some of the genius of the Seventh Adventist Church. And you can go and talk to people confidently and let them know that Jesus loves them, will love them forever, and he offers forgiveness. And he not only offers forgiveness, but he promises blessings in this life. Physical blessings, spiritual blessings. He takes the guilt away of our human nature. God promises to do this because of the work of Jesus Christ. I praise him that my voice lasted, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.